They came from the parlors and drawing rooms of a thousand provincial towns and villages. From a sheltered dream wrapped in Victorian elegance they came. The inheritors of a century that scarcely remembered war. Nothing, no training, no education, no books or films could have prepared them for the experience to come. In August 1914, a curtain of flame was drawn across the face of Europe. Every technological horror available to the most advanced nations on the planet was unleashed against the unprotected foot soldier. So they came to calm the horror, to ease the suffering, to work ceaseless hours in the service of their boys. To two world wars they came, to face the blood and the appalling risks, to become for hundreds of thousands of Canadian and Allied troops Angels of Mercy. As the guns of August drew near, it was obvious that there were simply not enough nurses ready to do the job. Yet within three weeks of the outbreak of war, applications had poured in, yielding the first wave of military and Red Cross volunteers. When I was very young, you know, they used to have posters of the Red Cross nurse and with the Red Cross cape and things like that. And uh, as just, I guess, seven or eight years old, I was kind of interested in these uh, nurses and always kind of liked to take care of people. And I always said, well, this is what I want to do when I grow up. I want to take care of six, so six soldiers, not knowing what it would be to be in a war. When I was training, the war hadn't started. I went in the February and the war didn't start until the September. And uh, so we had a lot of time to think it over. But I was very proud when I got when they accepted me. Nursing sisters, so called for the nuns who had practiced hospital care for centuries. By the end of the Great War, the Canadian Army Medical Corps alone included 3,141. Five out of six were on active service overseas. And when the call went out again in 1939, the first rank of volunteers was filled with the veterans of World War I. My mother was really distraught that I should be in the army, and she was always praying that I wouldn't go overseas. And then, of course, I did go overseas. All the girls who joined up, Initially, whether it was in the army or whatever, they hoped to get overseas, but everyone wasn't uh, that fortunate. I was working with the um, health department, mental health department in the city of Montreal, doing mental tests in school, and I missed the bedside care so much. I think this is what made my mind up about trying to join the army and uh, I was well served there because pure bedside care was what it was then. I saw an ad in the paper where they wanted nurses for, to join in services. I did apply to the Army uh, six months before I was accepted to the Air Force. I got tired of them waiting to call me, so I went down and applied for the Air Force and I was called the Air Force first. I think everyone was caught up in the fever of war and the, um, the ex well, I guess there was excitement about it because people were joining up and um, 
Well, my own brother had been in the Navy for some time then, and my father had been with the engineers for a long time. And I had written to Regina to say I would like to serve, and all of a sudden I got a phone call. And there I was, and the, the f person who interviewed me in Saskatoon said, well, could you have a medical tomorrow? I said, yes, and when could you come? I said, well, when would you like me? Well, I was there in about three days. So that's how I became a member of the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps. Fully trained from their schools, Canadian nurses had been the first to be fully accepted into a military force. And by earning officer status for the profession, they advanced the cause of women wherever they went. But coming to grips with the idea of patient care in a war zone was often a new and very different experience. It was a very uh, uh, interesting uh, time because we had very little training. The officer commanding gave us about one hour a week telling us what we're to do. And the one thing I remember him saying is to remember if anybody attacks your patients, you have to shoot first. You don't wait. You are there to protect the patients. And I thought I could never shoot anything, never shoot anybody. But he, they ground that into us very, very definitely. At the end of the two weeks of lectures, we were taken to sea on a minesweeper so that we actually saw firsthand the conditions under which the, uh, the seamen would have to, to wor work. We learned something about um, the formation of the medical corps, you, sort of the formations that belong within the system. There was the field ambulances where there were casualty collecting posts, and there were field dressing stations, there were casualty clearing stations, general hospitals, and so on. You went, you knew the, the route of evacuation of, of patients back from the forward areas to the general hospitals. To be able to recognize people and their ranks was very important in the Army, and the functions of the different groups of Army, too. We even learned a bit about guns, because they figured at one time, patients who've been on the front for a while have to discuss this with you, so nurses had to know a little bit about that. Well, at one time, we were flight lieutenants, but... Uh, we had one stripe taken away from us um, because of not wanting to march or, or parade, so we were demoted to a flying officer. Here we were, um, women, we were strong, carrying 40 pounds of gear, and as we were going towards the train, marching in marching order, uh, here were the men from the Army Service Corps in trucks. They were all transported in truck with their gear to the ship. But our colonel decided that we had to be strong enough to be able to carry our own packs, and we did. And my companion, Sally, fell, and I wasn't allowed to pick her up or anything. People just marched around her. It was terrible. If we were just we were soldiers, and we were to act like soldiers. Over there, over we were very fortunate. Uh, our unit was formed very quickly because they wanted one French-Canadian hospital overseas at that time. So as soon as our training was finished, we were shipped over. Unrestricted U-boat warfare, a critical and tragic escalation in naval tactics. For most of the sisters in both wars, it meant that transatlantic travel had gone from a romantic dream to a desperate nightmare. Yet it was part of the price they paid for the privilege of serving, part of their giant step into the unknown. Going over, we were in a convoy with about 13 ships. At that time, you know, during the First World War, the ships zigzagged, they, they zigzag in order to prevent being torpedoed. Well, our ship was, they were attempting to, por to por torpedo it while we were there, and we were all ready to go in the lifeboats, because we always had to have our life uh, preservers on anyhow. So we were prepared to go on there, and anyhow, overhead, they were all 
uh, battleships, you see, and things like that. But anyhow, uh, we did get over safely, but the same ship was torpedoed and destroyed on the way back. On June 27, 1918, the hospital ship Landovery Castle was torpedoed off Ireland. One of its lifeboats drifted helplessly into the suction of the sinking vessel. On board were 14 Canadian nursing sisters. A witness said, unflinchingly and calmly, as steady as if on parade, they faced the ordeal of certain death. None survived. By June 1942, U-boats were sinking one Allied ship every four hours. Such was the backdrop against which nurses sailed to duty in World War II. We went aboard this very small vessel. It was called the SS Kavina. And we learned afterwards that it was a banana boat that had um, run bananas. It was a refrigerated little ship, and it ran, it ran uh, bananas from the tropics up to New York, so on. And it was very small, and I thought probably it was the little sort of thing that was going to take us out to the ship that we were going to go on across the Atlantic. But it turned out we, we went on the Covina. We were on the New Amsterdam, and there were 17 of us that were put in one uh, room that was ordinarily used for two people on the ship in peacetime. There were 17 of us, and we were layered so close together that if I wanted to turn over, I had to poke the sister up above me. She lifted up her hip so I could turn over. We had to go way down in the bottom of the ship several times because there were a lot of submarines at the time, we were told and we'd stay in the dark for some hours, and then when we'd come up the surface, we'd see oil all over the, the sea, and we were told that probably a little corvette or a destroyer uh, had been hit, or else a submarine had been, and you'd hear the depth charges. As you were down below, that was really a hellish noise. You'd hear the depth charge, and you'd be there in the dark, uh, that wasn't very pleasant. But as soon as you got up on the deck again all together, you know, you'd forget. You st it still hadn't sunken in what the war was and that we were going to it. We landed in Liverpool, and before we got to Liverpool, uh, we were standing on the edge, and they played Oh Canada. And that was very emotional after six days at sea in the blackouts and so on. And then suddenly this barrage of balloons came up. And I thought, oh, isn't that wonderful? We don't have balloons in Canada. And this officer grabbed me and took me over at the other part of the ship where I couldn't see them. I didn't know there were condoms that were blown up or French safes as they were called then. But I thought that was quite a celebration. All the gals were on the, the uh, wharf waiting for the men with their cards, and they were throwing chocolates over. It was a, a great experience for somebody as innocent as we were. We really were when I look back. In the peak year of World War I, 12 Canadian hospitals in Europe handled as many as 90,000 casualties, getting their patients well enough to be moved back to hospitals in Britain or Canada. They responded to wounds that had never been seen before, trauma on a scale unheard of to that time. And they did it under conditions that were scarcely better than those of the trench soldiers themselves. Of course, all of our hospitals we're in tents. We lived in tents, too, with earth floors. When you think of it now and people wonder about their floors, we didn't even, uh, it was just the tent and then the earth. 
and uh, we lived in these tents, and the hospital was tents too. And of course, uh, uh, when there was an air raid, we always had to lower the, the beds were low anyhow, they were just cut, but we had to lower the, the beds right to the floor, so the shrapnel all around the outside of the tents, uh, there were uh, sandbags piled up, you know, quite high, so if there was shrapnel, it wouldn't hit the patient. In a raid, there was often little choice. The enemy shrapnel raining from above, or the large, aggressive rats fed on human flesh in no man's land, waiting below. The stretcher bearers would pick them up in the battlefield and bring them to the nearest hospital. But I remember the first convoy, I guess the only time that I really cried was the convoy of people coming in that were gassed. And that's almost worse than people with amputations, things like that, because the gas cases, you know, their eyes are practically bulging out their tongue. And, and uh, it's, it's a very uh, awful sight when you see gas patients. In the Second World War, there weren't the amputations. You could get it, put them in a plane, they were in their blighty right away, or their, they had everything every equipment, but in the First World War, they didn't, if a leg is gangrene, off it came. Improved medical procedures, new drugs, faster transport, and simple experience helped to reduce the number of deaths in World War II, despite the fact that many more were under arms than in the First World War. Canadian nursing sisters watched with their allied counterparts as the Battle of Britain unfolded, looking after its casualties, assisting as new forms of medicine were developed, and once again, caring for boys with new and terrible injuries. We had a, a feeling that we were there to help, but I don't think we knew that it would be as constant, as persistent, and as uh, draining as it was. Uh, we worked long hours, we weren't supposed to, but I was in charge of the operating room and I would have to work 12 hours on and then two or three hours off and 12 hours on. But the reality of it, we knew there would be bombs, uh, we knew there would be injuries, we knew uh, that there would be death, but we never knew it would be on such a large scale. Disaster of Dieppe. As one nurse remembered, the first time we really worked. Nearly 600 badly wounded and demoralized soldiers poured into the hospitals in Britain, the first of a wave of casualties that totaled nearly 70% of the Canadian force. Three years later, the brutality of the German defenders would be repaid a thousandfold. It was to begin on June 6, 1944. And I can remember when uh, D-Day, uh, the, all the planes were flying overhead, and uh, as they did every night, but this was very noisy. And she came up to my room, uh, it was still dark, and she said, Sister, sister, the invasion started. I know it has. Get the operating room ready. And here I was sound asleep, and I said, Gee, they're just still flying over. We can't get them back this quickly. And she said, I know, come and look. And we could see two levels of planes. The Americans were flying up high in formation. The British were coming back out of formation. So there were two levels, one level going over, one level coming back. And that was D-Day, I remember so well. And all that day, the planes were going overhead. When I arrived in London, they, I was met by the Secret Service police. And it, they handed me this notice to go to the sisters' quarters on Cromwell Road. A transport would pick me up at 0800 hours the next morning and take me to the North Holt Airport. And I would be proceeding there by air, from there by air to France. 
there were quite a number of casualties at this airstrip. And the doctors asked me if I would stay for a while and help them. It seemed to me sometimes that they were barely conscious from their surgery before we were able to get them loaded onto the Dakotas and, and away, and that was marvelous. That was really wonderful. You never knew if you'd ever see them again. That was the, the terrible part of it, of course. And so you enjoyed each other's company every second because nobody knew. You know, they could be called into action that night and not come back. We had a lot of uh, problems from at, at long stays at sea where the men would be exposed to severe cold. Many of our patients came in off of the uh, North Atlantic run with either frozen extremities or what we called immersion foot problem. Because of their feet being cold and wet for such long periods, uh, while I was in France, I got a chance to go down to Cherbourg shortly after the Americans had liberated it. And um, they had a lot of casualties. And going down, the, they didn't have time to bury all these boys at the time. And um, I'll never forget the smell of human bodies. It was terrible. We, uh, we stayed in the channel for 24 hours facing Antwerp and uh, you could see the bombing. That was, to us, that was real war there. And they didn't know, they were trying to land there, but it was impossible. So we went to Ostend. And our hospital was right in Antwerp after that. And we stayed there, I think, perhaps three or four months, no longer. And uh, at Christmas time, we were witnessing uh, bombings, the V2s, the buzz bombs there every night between 11 and 1. Because of the rockets, we were to be moved out of Antwerp because it wasn't a safe place to be. And at noon, a cinema was hit in the heart of the city, and um, it was dreadful. It was, it was just awful. And... Um, during the course of that time, um, I received a young British soldier in the ward, and he was covered with, he was white. They were all the casualties were white because the plaster just disintegrated, and they just looked like clowns, you know, with white fa painted faces. And uh, so I, I just said to him, well, how was it? And he said, Oh, it wasn't so bad, sister. You know, we were getting dug out, and they passed us down cups of tea. You know, tea and a British soldier, they go together. And um, so he was quite cheerful. And you know, that kid was dead in an hour from the concussion of the blast of that awful rocket that hit the cinema. But not marks, no marks on his body, but just that awful concussion. We had about 400 to 500 casualties. 24 hours later, they were still bringing them just before Christmas. So the Red Cross girls had worked so hard at getting a little bit of cheerfulness and whatever trees they could find. But you walked into the ward, it was nothing but moaning. We had buckets of, uh, I should say buckets, we had barrels of ice crushed and boxes. So until the patient was taken to the hospital to the surgery, we used to just put the limbs in the, these boxes, piled with glass and ices, and you could, um, you could just hear the moaning. It got worse and worse, and the patients couldn't stand the, to hear bombings again. So they closed the hospital a few days later. I remember the matron would have to come and pull us by the sleeve, saying, well, it's time you go off duty. You had no idea of the time. And sometimes somebody would bring you a sandwich. And um, it, it was uh, very, very uh, hard work. 
they were all young boys. They were, they were all about the same age, but so young, and some of them had lost an arm or both arms or a leg, uh, or they had a gaping wound. It really, my heart bled for them. And here they were, quote unquote, serving their country, and they should be so badly uh, maimed for life. I remember amongst there a, a little French soldier, a sailor, who just happened to be on the beach there. And he had no business, he wasn't on duty, and he was hit, and part of his face was gone. And he was there, the dear thing, you know, with holding his picture when he was very handsome in uniform. And he kept doing that if we went near him. And, uh, oh, you know, the soldiers again were the best ones around him, telling him Basingstoke was going to restore that, and uh, they never left him. But that's about the saddest one I do, because what can you say? And one that I recall specifically was one soldier, um, one patient who was a soldier, motioned to me and he said, Sister, I want to speak to you. And I said, yes. And he had this leg in a plaster cast that was not straight, it was in, in a crouched position. And he said, Sister, they want to amputate my leg. Don't let them. If they do, I'll die. And I said, oh, well, they'll do what's better, best for you. He said, I could never face my wife. I could never go home. I'll die if they take my leg off. Oh, I said, no. He said, Sister, if they take my leg off, I'll die. And so I said, well, they'll do the best they can for you, because I couldn't promise anything. So when he went into the operating room, it was the last one down the corridor, I went in, and Brigadier McFarlane was then inspecting all the difficult cases. He came only when there were cases that our own surgeons couldn't handle. And they took the cast off this, uh, he was an officer, took it off of this officer's uh, leg, and the nerve was exposed, and he was in utter agony. So they started to give him anesthetic just to, so he could stand the pain. And the two surgeons that were there said, uh, Brigadier McFarlane, sir, we'll have to amputate. And he looked at it, and he said, sister, what do you think? And I was so surprised that any doctor would ever ask me for a medical opinion. And I said, Brigadier McFarlane, if you amputate his leg, he'll die, he told me. He said, okay, pad the leg up, put a plaster cast on, send him back to Canada on priority. And the little aside is that when I was coming back for the Far East Forces um, after my tour of duty in, in um, the European theater, I heard this man, or I heard a man saying, Sister Salem, Sister Salem." It's this dark of night in Montreal, and we were all returning. All It was full of troops on that train. And this was this officer patient, and here he was, still with his leg, uh, with crutches, uh, not in a cast that I could see. He had trousers on. And I said, you made it home? And he said, yes, and with two legs. We had had one young German, a young Hitler's youth, very young, and uh, dying, not wanting blood, not wanting anything. His arms stayed up in the air, saying, Heil Hitler, until his strength left him. And uh, the young ones were so arrogant, and they were like, their faces were like marble statues, no expression. You'd offer morphine for their wounds, knowing they needed and they'd refuse it. Not a muscle in the face would move. But the older ones were, were totally different. They would cry. You gave them a, a glass of powdered milk, they would cry, be so happy because they saw the milk. I guess they hadn't seen for so long, but because you were kind to them. Because some of them, uh, I remember going to the operating room and crying, bitter nickstab and thinking they were taken there to have their throats slit. So the propaganda probably had been um, very bad that way.
For the wartime nurses, their share seemed to be endless hours, hard physical work, the unavoidable heartbreak of seeing so many young lives shattered. Some would watch their labor of love end in death, or in a return to the fighting and the danger. Yet through it all, there was an intensity of feeling, an eagerness to embrace life. It was a British hospital, and there were British doctors. Of course, there were all the British patients there. And you see, I was with the, with the British, and uh, the British, you know, always wait on their tea. And you know, they had, even in these tents, they'd always have a little area where they'd uh, have their tea. And the doctors, of course, were there too. Well, I just, because I didn't like tea anyhow, so I just went ahead and started doing the dressings. Patients, you know, clamoring for have, uh, well, some relief. It wasn't much relief, but some relief for these dressings. So having been a surgeon's assistant, I just went ahead and looked after these patients. So when the nurses came out, they were just simply almost says, well, you can't do that without a doctor's orders. I said, well, I didn't come over here to drink tea. <laughs> I was sort of upset about that. So anyhow, they thought the doctors would be all furious about that. Do you know, it was the funniest thing. The doctors came over and congratulated me and took me out for dinner. The nursing sisters were very much in demand socially. Every time a ship would come in, they'd call one of the residences, whether it was Army, Navy, or Air Force. And I remember them dancing with a couple of Russians who were very pleasant. We didn't understand them because we didn't know the language. And uh, they danced a little differently from our boys. They were quite stiff, but uh, they were charming like most of the others. Colonel Haynes, he was quite a gambler. And um, I played dice with him one night. And he lost quite a bit of money. So he was really mad. He stormed out the door and he said, my mother told me never to play with dames. So he really was very cross. So the next day I felt kind of badly about it. And I, I took him back took the money back to him and went into his office, and he wouldn't accept it. You know, we go on picnics together and go swimming together, and, and um, uh, the first time I had a day off, I remember I went with, um, he wasn't from our unit, he was a, he was an eye man from uh, Regina and I'd known him in Regina and he was a great guy and he came one day with a jeet and said, would you like to go up to Sherbrooke? And I said, would I ever? And I, I had, this is my day off. And so we went up to Sherbrooke and, and um, to the Americans and we got lost, and, but we were able to, we happened to run into a, an American hospital and it was, it was just one, they were marvelous to us. <laughs> Well, I went to Nice, you know, down Monte Carlo and Nice. I did get one leap they leave there, and that was marvelous. And you know, it was heaven. On the way down, we had to stop over in Paris, and we went to a hotel. I was another nurse and myself, and we stayed at this hotel. And we said, oh, to sleep in a real bed. That was the greatest pleasure. There was a lot of um, romances, a lot of uh, uh, extramarital relations, we have to say. I'm sure there were. Uh, the matron called us together once. I think she thought that some of the sisters were acting beyond what they should, and she gave us this long lecture about there was no sense going with these married officers that they had wives back home, and they would leave them once they got home and she might just as well have saved your breath. Because when people are living under that tension of war and wondering if you'll be alive tomorrow, it was quite a different world than when you were kind of certain that tomorrow would come.
this one was married in Tilburg. The traffic stopped, the whole town was at a standstill, and I was her bridesmaid, and it was beautiful. And she was warning me all the time, because I'm Catholic now, but remember, don't you go and kneel all over the place. And bless my soul, when the wedding was over, the minister came over and kissed me instead of the bride, because we were both dressed the same way. So I said, but it was a beautiful, beautiful wedding. I was married on the 31st of March, 1944. And uh, my husband's name was Ralph Millman. He went missing on the 11th of May, a month and a half after we were married. He called me the night before, but of course, uh, you couldn't tell anything over the telephone, but I had a feeling that he was going out. And um, <clears throat> the day that I got word that he went missing, Jesse Young and I, we, we had rooms to get a room together. And that night, uh, I was up looking out the window at the sky, and Jessie wakened up, and she said, Millie, what in the world are you doing? And I said, well, I don't know, Jessie, but I just feel as if something is wrong. And uh, when I went over to breakfast, I got word that he had gone missing, just about that hour, apparently, 2 o'clock in the morning. Twice, the guns fell silent, ending the horror for a time. At the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, the killing would cease for an all too brief span of two decades. When we heard this armistice, you know the bells rang and the lights this was the most, you know, everything was always in darkness. And when we saw, we'd look around, and just from our hospital, and of course then there were big trucks or something like that, and nurses and if it wasn't on duty, and soldiers would get on this truck, and we'd go through the streets, and everybody was just shouting and singing. I remember that, and just to see the lights. It's just to feel free that you could go out and uh, not have to worry about lights or, or a plane uh, dropping bombs on you. It was, it was a marvelous feeling. It was just a marvelous feeling to feel, well, it's over. And then we began to think, goodness, we're going to have to go home. And then we began to almost dread it, thought, oh, goodness, it's too bad it's over now, we're going to have to go home. Yeah. For the nurses, the eerie silence in the wards was momentary at best. As the last of the frontline casualties were cycled through, there came the released prisoners of war, often dangerously ill. And finally, the nurses had charge of much of the medical care of a quarter of a million returning soldiers and 50,000 of their dependents. Still, a curious lightness and sense of freedom and relief was everywhere. The experience of May 8, 1945, VE Day, echoed a similar excitement. Uh, hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight Tuesday, the 8th of May. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. You know, we'd heard that the day was coming and it was sort of rumored, you know, and finally it happened. And um, the Germans surrendered in Holland. And um, 
it wasn't very exciting in the hospital. I think everybody was so relieved. They were sort of stunned. It's it's over. It's you know couldn't believe. I guess it had it had happened. And we had a we had a very special service in the chapel that day. You know of Thanksgiving, and. Um, but then in the afternoon, the people from the village near us came. And they came, just so many of them. And everybody in that group had something orange on for the House of Orange, of course. Little girls had orange hair ribbons, and men had orange ribbons tied over their sleeve, their coats. And they were just so happy, so overjoyed. When you think what those people went through, it must have been one, for that generation, it must have been probably one of the days they'll never forget. One of the days that'll stand in their memory forever. It was just incredible. By the end of World War II, 4,480 nurses of the Canadian military, with their civilian counterparts, had dealt expertly and kindly with more than 60,000 wounded from every allied nation. God alone knows how many lives they saved. For many, the instruments of surrender signaled a much-awaited return to the simpler pleasures of Civvy Street. When my husband was overseas in the 1919, before he came back, he kept saying every letter, get out of that nursing. I never want to see another uniform as long as I live. And when he came home, I was still in uniform. That was a great disappointment to him. <laughs> oh, it was exciting. We came home in the Elder France. It took us about four or five days. It was incredible. Uh, we had 22 in our cabin. Um, and um, the, I, we were the only women, and it was just packed with RCAF prisoners of war. We landed in Halifax, and um, well, it definitely was Canada, although there was sea air there. I always say there's a very special smell to Canada in August. You smell the, the clover, the hay, and it is a sweet smell about Canada. And we all marveled at this. We were on the train almost right away, and coming to several stations, there they were patients who knew, they'd seen your name in the paper, and patients who would come and say hello. Hundreds of stories remain untold. During World War I, the terrible conditions at Salonika in the Eastern Mediterranean, the heroic efforts that followed the Halifax explosion of 1917, the courage of Canadian nursing sisters taken prisoner at the fall of Hong Kong in 1941, noble achievements in South Africa, in Russia, and in Italy. As the sound of the gunfire fades into the past, there are fewer now to remember the toil, the pain, the joy, and the love for the boys. The love that brought them to the very gates of hell. I don't think there's one boy that went overseas that came back in the same condition they went in. Physically, I don't think they did. Mentally or something wrong else with them, something else. I don't think any of them came back perfect. As our matron had said before we left in St. John, the matron in chief on the little platform there in St. John was saying to us, but remember, 
You'll do what you can with what you have, but you will never come back enriched scientifically, but you'll be so much more human. And I think this is what we learned being together. All those, those young people who had died, you know, what have they died for? And I think there was sadness. Well, it was for me, I know, at the potential that was lost. Because, you know, all those young men, not only Canadians, but Germans, everybody who was involved. You know, they might have been geniuses in a, in a particular field. Um, they could have been other Einsteins, they could have been wonderful musicians, or they could have been clever scientists and doctors, and, you know, and it was gone. That's the total waste, and, and that is the awful part of war, I think, that terrible loss. All the sisters of mercy, they are not departed or gone. They were waiting for me when I thought that I just can't go on. And they brought me their comfort and later they brought me this song. It's something that one uh, can always remember, but you want to forget. <laughs>